What is up everyone, my name is Soren Iverson. I'm a product designer currently working at Cash App, and today I'm going to walk through the basics of designing text fields in Figma. The first part of this video will focus more on concepts and theory, while I'll do a demo of how to create components at the end. If you want to skip to the demo or any other part of the video, you can do so in the notes below. All right, let's dive in. Text fields are the primary way that people enter and edit text when using websites and apps. Google's material design site provides three simple principles to remember when designing text fields. First, they should be discoverable. This sounds obvious, but we want to make sure that users are able to quickly find and enter the information required with the text field. Second principle is clear. Each text field should be easy to distinguish from each other. This is largely dependent on spacing and how you label each field rather than having a unique design. However, designing them to be distinguishable from backgrounds or other elements is important too. Finally, they need to be efficient. This means they are easy to use, particularly when it comes to helper text, error states, or character counters that guide users to enter the correct information into text fields. Now let's look at the different types of text fields. Visually, there are two styles you can choose from. You can either have an outlined or filled text field. On top of that, you can opt to put the label in or outside of the field. When I worked at Square, we would use outline text fields that had a label inside. The reason for this was partially because of the larger tap target it created, given that the product is often used on a tablet or point of sale device. All of these approaches work, but for this video, I'm going to use the outlined text field with the label outside of the container. Let's now break down the anatomy of a text field. On this screen, I've laid out a typical text field design. The indigo boxes point to required parts of the field, while pink boxes indicate optional aspects of the text field. In the middle, we have the most basic part of any text field, the input text, which is the place where users will type, and the container, the area that contains the text and any icons associated with the text field. Next to that, we have the label text. This is used to describe what the container text should be. For example, if you're supposed to enter your email, the label would say email. The label can be inside or outside of the container. Next, we have leading and trailing icons. You might use a leading icon for a date picker, while a trailing icon might be used for a dropdown or error indicator, but I'll go into more detail on this later. Finally, we have helper text. Helper text can be used to explain the purpose of a field, requirements like numbers or capitalization for a password, or to show errors created by the user. Now that we have the anatomy of a text field down, let's look at best practices for label text. When labeling a text field, you want to be both brief and specific. For example, I've shown here you would want to say something like meeting link rather than a longer description like Paste the link here so others can join your meeting. Sometimes a field requires more explanation than what you can fit into the label. In this case, it's a good idea to either use placeholder text or helper text. Here you can see two examples of how to use helper text. Let's say you're designing mortgage software. People may not know how to locate their loan number. By adding helper text, you could reduce the likelihood of people entering the wrong number and make sure that they know where to look for it if they don't know the number. Another more common use for helper text is when creating a password. Some software will require special characters numbers, or other text elements in a password. Since these requirements are unique to the platform, you can provide context for people creating a password in the helper text. I've even seen labels that will change to a success state when you've met the password creation requirements. Helper text can be replaced with error messages too. If someone enters incorrect or incomplete information in a text field, it is a good idea to try and help the user understand what they did wrong. This means not only indicating that a field is incorrect, but also giving specific advice. For example, rather than saying invalid loan number, we might say loan number must be 10 digits. Or for the password, we would say specifically what the user is missing when created a password. In this case, they did not include a special character, so we would notify them of that. Specific, helpful writing in software can have a significant positive impact on conversion, reduce customer complaints when properly implemented, and make your product overall more pleasant to use for the end customer. This is part of why error messages are so important. Helper text and error messages can also be substituted out for a character counter. Sometimes, text fields require longer form content, like a description. When this is the case, the text field is usually larger to accommodate more text, and it sometimes includes a character counter. It's a good idea to use a character counter when there's either a technical limitation or an ideal character count that you want people to aim for. For example, if you were creating a job board where people could post open positions, you may want to set a 2,000 character limit. On the other hand, if you had online menu software, you might cap the description of a food item at a couple hundred characters. When including a character counter, it's important to consider where this information will live, be it in an internal database or in a customer-facing experience. This will help you to decide whether or not to include one in the first place and how long it should be. Now let's look at adding leading icons. A leading icon comes before the input text in a container and can be used to describe the type of content a field requires. It can also be a touch or tap 
tap target for a nested component. For example, if I wanted to include a date picker in my design, I could add a calendar icon before the date. This would indicate the type of information needed, and when I click on the field, people could expect to see a date picker element appear. In addition to leading icons, I can also add trailing icons. A trailing icon is much more flexible than a leading icon and can serve many different purposes. It could be used to clear the contents of a field that had been entered. It could act as a show slash hide indicator for a password field. You could add an icon for a drop-down menu, or it could be conditional and only show up when an error has occurred. These icons are entirely optional, but including them can make interacting with text fields more efficient or provide additional context when interacting with things like errors or complex fields that might require a tooltip. Now that we understand all the aspects of a text field, it's important to know how to lay them out in different contexts. Here I've mocked up what it would look like to add text fields on both a mobile and a desktop device. On a mobile device, it is common for a field to take up the majority of the screen width unless it is a smaller input like the security code on a credit card. On the other hand, text fields should not take up the majority of a screen on desktop Top. The reason for this is that legibility can be compromised when our eyes constantly have to move from the left to the right side of the screen. Because of this, we want to bound input fields by flexible margins on larger screens, like I've done so here. Finally, let's look at the states of a text field. There are six for us to review. First is inactive, which is when the user is not interacting with the text field in any way. Next is hover. The hover state is shown when my mouse is over the text field area. In this case, the container turns a slightly darker gray on hover, as you can see here. Then we have active. active is the interim state that occurs when we interact with the button. Say if I hovered over this button and clicked, for a brief moment this text field would turn this darker gray shown in the activated state. Next is the focus state. When I have the text field selected, either by clicking or navigating it to it through my keyboard, it would turn this purple. This means that the field is ready to receive input. If I started typing now, information would show up. Then we have the error state. If I entered and submitted incorrect information, the field would turn this red color to reflect that the information was not correct and needs to be updated. I could optionally add an icon or helper text here as well to provide additional clarity. Finally, we have a disabled state. If for some reason we do not want people interacting with the text field, maybe because they need to complete a previous step or enter other information first, the field and placeholder text would be this lighter gray color. This means when people try to hover or click over it, they would not be able to access it. Now that I've shown you how all of these pieces work together, let's create a text field from scratch. First, I'm going to add some text. Then I'm going to hit Shift A to enable auto layout. I'm going to add 16 pixels of padding on the left and right and 12 on the top and bottom. Now we can add a stroke that will act as the container of our field. Let's do that. We'll make this a lighter gray color and we'll add six pixels of rounding too. Let's duplicate this text that we added in the beginning. Give it eight pixels of spacing between the input field and the label. We'll have this say country, name, We'll default this to United States. We'll apply auto layout to both of these, left align. Let's say we want to make this field for mobile and we want 24 pixels of padding on either side of the screen. If we're working with a 375 pixel wide screen, which is what you would typically see for an iPhone 11 Pro, you're going to get something like this. If we want 24 pixels of spacing, what we're going to do is we're going to set the width of this field to 327. You'll notice that if I start typing more text here, it breaks through the input field and doesn't wrap like we would expect it to. So what we're going to do here is we're going to change this from hug to fill container. Let's take this back to the United States. Now what I want to do is add a trailing indicator. What I'm going to do here is set the width of this to be a fixed 24 pixel width. I'm going to change this type to say caret down. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to change this to font awesome. And when I do that, you'll see it replaces it with a caret icon. And I'm gonna set this to solid so that it's filled. This adds a drop-down icon to the right side of your field. And you can see here, if I toggle this back and forth, it would go from leading indicator to trailing indicator. Lastly, I wanna make this semi-bold. I'm gonna tighten up this kerning a little bit. I'm gonna reduce the opacity of this a little bit here. Finally, I'm gonna add some text below. And I'm gonna change this to say, country you currently live in. 
And there you go. You now have a text field that can serve many different purposes based on the information that you need to collect. Thanks so much for taking the time to watch this video. I hope you now have a stronger understanding of text fields, how and when to use different features that they have, and feel ready to start making your own components based on what you've learned. If you want to learn more, you can visit Google's Material Design website. I've included that in the notes below. If you haven't already, please like, comment, and subscribe. Your support means a lot. I'm Soren, and I'll see you in the next video.